Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I am your host, Christopher Brown. Last month, we ventured to Brandon, Manitoba amidst the buzz of the 2024 Association of Manitoba Municipalities Conference. Now, amidst the vibrant energy of the event, we seized the opportunity to engage with local leaders hailing from across the province. This is our very last episode from that convention. So sit back and we'll be right back after a quick message with Cross Border Interviews featuring Councillor Bruce LeBouc from the city of Brandon. In the heart of every thriving community lies a well-crafted strategic plan. But crafting such a plan requires expertise, experience, and a deep understanding of local needs. Enter Strategic Steps, your partner in municipal strategic planning. Strategic Steps team of experts have years of experience in municipal administration at Strategic Steps, they just don't develop plans. They co-create homegrown strategies tailored to your unique community. They listen, they collaborate, they empower your community to thrive. Contact Strategic Steps today and take the first step towards a brighter future for your municipality. Call Strategic Steps at 780-416-9255 or visit strategicsteps.ca to get started. Bruce, thank you so much for doing this. I want to start by asking, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, it's a big question. <laughs> That's um, why I start with that. Oh, yeah. No, so I would think there is probably a couple of answers to that. Number one, um, uh, growing up in Saskatchewan. Yes, I grew up in Saskatchewan. Uh, both uh, parents served in some capacity on, you know, whether it was uh, RM councils or school boards or something similar to that so there was always that ingrained in in the family in that regard i've and got then, to ask though before you continue what rm do you uh, know rm of key west okay <laughs> for and then uh it was the would be the uh Ogemaw school board okay which is the small town that i yep. grew up in <laughs> which for everybody that's about halfway between weyburn and assiniboy <laughs> on six highway if you want to know where that is um and then I, I, I think the second thing was, um, you know, I moved to Brandon in 1993 and uh, 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 was involved as a broadcaster uh, for 23 years in Brandon, but also got very involved with uh, particularly sports organizations, but organizations overall in volunteer capacity and things of that nature. And so you kind of get ingrained in the volunteer aspect of doing things in your community and I always feel like that's almost a little bit of a training ground for then becoming involved in municipal or school board um, um, uh, serving on those uh, boards or councils because uh, you always want to do what's right for that specific organization but then it's always about a little bit broader in the community and what's right for the community so I think that's where it kind of all started from and just kind of slowly grew into an opportunity to uh, you know run for election in 2018 and was successful in that and now uh, into term number number two. So what happened in 2018 that made you go get say okay municipal politics is where I want to follow I want to follow my family like they did but I'm going to get involved municipally you could have chosen federally you could have chose provincially but municipal is where you end it. Well I think it I think a couple things one uh, I had actually uh, talked about or discussed running uh, in the city election, you know, a few years prior, uh, and had met with, uh, at that time was the deputy mayor and had a discussion about it. But at that time with my job as a broadcaster and the amount of travel that I was doing, uh, for those that want to know that I was the voice of the Brandon Wheat Kings for 23 years. So that involved a lot of travel. Uh, it wasn't something I felt I could do to put the time commitment in and continue to do that job. Plus being a media member and on council is a little bit of a conflict in, yeah. in some ways. Um, so it kind of just festered in the background a little bit. I left the broadcasting business in 2016 and so that created um, a little bit more free time to, uh, to look at the opportunity. But also um, I think there was a, a point where um, you have some, uh, you know, you have some discussions with current councillors. John Loreggio, who was another former broadcast that I worked with at the radio station, had become a councillor at that time. And you start talking about things that they do or the interests that they have. And then the other thing that happened during my last couple of years as a broadcaster was that I became not only 
Voice of the Week Kings and that, but I also had an involvement on our news coverage side. Okay. Which also meant that I covered city council on occasion. And so you kind of get the idea of what's going on in your city from that standpoint. And I think it just kind of created an interest in me to get involved in that, that side of it. So I want to ask a stupid question, but as a former there are journal- no stupid questions. As the host of a show, yes, you, you should know there's always there's, stupid questions. There's always stupid answers. <laughs> there you go. But if I say a stupid question, then you can give the stupid answer to the stupid question, then it feels good. Okay. You get involved municipally because you're going to, and you're covering the events, uh, the council meetings, I should say. Have you seen a change in attitude towards City Hall compared to when you were covering it to now? Because when I was there, I, for those who were, who've were watched my social media, I attended one of your council meetings. I interrupted. I apologize once again because I got lambasted by two councillors from Alberta who said you shouldn't have said anything when the councillor, when the mayor called your name out. That's here nor there. Do you see an apathy when it comes to actually engaging in what's going on at City Hall compared to when you were covering it? Uh, well, I think, I think it's more prevalent in the sense that you see it more publicly because of social media. Yeah. And so one of the things kind of, for me, and maybe it's advice for others, uh, you have to stop looking at the comment sections on social media when the city posts stuff. Uh, And that's a big thing, honestly. And and the reason is, is because, um, number one, you may not even know if the person commenting is from your community and the, and the second thing is they may not have all the facts and I think a big part of what you do as a counselor now when you're interacting with residents or organizations is you have to make sure that you're presenting factual information and that part of that is that you have to be engaged as a counselor to actually know what that information is and so to me I think that's one of the bigger challenges personally is I always say I'm a I'm a, keep being a counselor is a full-time job for part-time pay but it is a part-time job but there's a lot of commitment to making sure that you're reading the reports and you're reading the the master plans that come your way and you're you know responding to residents and you're talking to staff about things that are going on in your corporation and so there's a lot more I think involved in that aspect to make sure you're up to date on everything that's going on than they used to be because I think you know prior to social media I think you could show up for your meeting every two weeks and that was the information you had and that was the information that was really out in the public yeah. at that time but now the information is almost out on a daily basis on things that are going on in your community okay so there's two questions i want to ask and i'm not sure which one i should ask so i'm going to ask the one that i think it's more prevalent to what you just said social media has become a tool that everyone uses but social media is a double-edged sword as well but the average resident, that's how they communicate with their elected officials. So while you jokingly say don't read the comment section, sometimes you have to because that's the only way that you're seeing engagement in communities across Canada. I'm not saying just Brandon, I'm saying across Canada. So how do you engage with people to ensure that you're hearing from people and not just the social media keyboard warriors? So I think I think there's a couple of things. One, when I when I say don't read the comments, I, I, what I'm what I mean is is uh, you have to maybe take them with a grain of salt or, or, or maybe not necessarily ignore them, but don't react based on necessarily what is being said on comments because I think a lot of times the more negative people or negative aspects of what you're doing as a, as a council or as a city are what shows up on yeah. social media and, and not so much on the positive side. I can tell you, like, as a counselor, there's not many residents that phone you very often to congratulate you on what a great job you're doing or how good your streets are or everything else. It's usually because they have an issue or they have a concern or they have a problem that they want your assistance in, in helping. But I think the other important thing when it comes to engaging with our, our residents is you have to do it in, in ways outside of all the tools that you have to do it sitting in your home office. 
right? Like you have social media, you have email, you have it. But the important thing is, and I do this uh, probably 90% of the time, if I get a uh, resident that either phones or emails me with a concern, I usually go to their place and meet with them in person. And I think it's important to have that personal touch with your residents, especially those that are reaching out with a concern. And I do think they appreciate that a lot more uh, when you go and meet with them uh, in person. And I think the other thing that we've, we're starting to get a little bit better at as a, as a city of Brandon is to have kind of open houses on uh, topics or issues that are prevalent for or top of mind for a lot of people in our community and I think as counselors it's also important even though you're probably just a fly on the wall or you're sitting in the back seats or whatever that you attend and you hear what your residents are telling your staff and what their concerns are. So I want to flip to challenges because I feel like we're getting the sort of the wrap-up message here from the people who are cleaning up the Keystone but I've got to ask uh, because I ask this all the time and I'm going to preface it as I always do this is a conversation between the counselor and myself not a motion of counsel not a direction of counsel not a policy. What do you believe is the biggest challenge facing Brandon? today uh well i think probably like other communities it's our vulnerable population how that impacts our community as a whole um and and you know everybody knows there's no easy solutions and and what i what i what we struggle with a little bit i feel that as municipal officials municipal politicians uh we're on the front lines of those issues but most of the time the issues related to that are not municipal uh, areas, right? It's usually so it's involved the with health care, it's mental health, it's addiction, it's things of that nature. Uh, Brandon also has, uh, you know, is the hub of our area, but also is the hub for uh, people coming from northern Manitoba to Brandon, whether it might be for a medical appointment or things like that, and then not returning home. Uh, which creates, uh, you know, a lot more uh, homeless population in our community than you might see other ways. And part of it, too, uh, is just policy of provincial governments. And I don't know if it's like this in others, but, you know, in small towns, when you used to have healthcare facilities, doctors, nurses in smaller towns, people would go there for their medical appointments. They could get it close to their home. Well, now that they're traveling to more of a central hub like Brandon, um, that's where all the services are, and that means people want to stay here. Yeah. And um, so that's a big part of it. And then I, I just... Do you think you've got a good control on it, though, as the city? Uh, no, I, I don't. I think we're trying our best. We've got a lot of irons in the fire. We've got a lot of things that we're, we're you know, researching or trying to do. But I don't think the problem is better today than it was a year ago, right? And so... To say that we have a handle on it, you know, would probably be a bit of a stretch. It's a continuing uh, issue that we need to continue to deal with in, in many matters. I've said this on some other interviews that I've done. One of the big things I feel could benefit Brandon and, and might be a game changer for us is uh, an Indigenous wellness center and cultural center because a large portion of our vulnerable and homeless population is indigenous in Brandon and I think that could be a frontline service for them to uh, become more uh, productive members of our community um, and and help deal with whatever the issue is that's causing their their homelessness so uh, to me that's a that's a big one that uh, we need to continue to work with both senior levels of government the feds and province i don't know if any of them listen but there's a federal building that is empty in downtown brandon that would be a <laughs> great spot if the federal government wanted to donate it for that cause. Well, it seems like the federal government's on a big kick for housing, so why not, right? Yeah. Um, so I want to flip the script a little bit in my last question to you because I know you have a meeting that you have to get to, but what are the accomplishments that you boast about about Brandon? What is the thing that you say, you know what, while we do have our challenges, which every municipality does, this is the thing that we're doing right? Well, uh, this is one thing we're kind of doing right. Uh, For those who are listening, he is uh, waving at the Keystone Center here in Brandon, so, Manitoba. Uh, I also serve as chair of the Keystone Center Board of Directors. So we're in this 540,000 square foot facility. 
uh, which is, uh, you know, in our 2024 calendar right now, we're scheduled to have 2,800 event days. Uh, if you walked out the doors uh, 50 feet uh, in front of us, there's a hockey tournament, spring hockey tournament going on. Uh, so, so this is a key economic driver in our community, and we are doing it right in a lot of ways. We do struggle, like many event facilities, with operating costs that have gone through the roof in the last three or four years. And uh, with that, tourism and event hosting has not fully recovered from the pandemic and probably won't for a couple more years. And so that is something that we are struggling with right now as a, as a facility. And because the province and the city are funding partners with this facility, those are discussions uh, that we're having there. Um, I do feel like you talked about some of the uh, vulnerable population issues that we're, we're making some inroads there. We're doing things um, to try and mitigate that. So that's another thing I think we're we're doing right. I think we're building a brand new outdoor sports complex, which is another key thing that has taken a while for us to achieve, but uh, that should be open by this time next year. Yep. And um, so that's that's something I think we're, we're providing to the community. And, you know, I, I, I think sometimes, you know, we get our water treatment upgrades. We're doing the wastewater project to help uh, not only uh, build more residential development, but commercial development as well. So I think there's a lot of things going on in our community that we should be proud of that does come at a bit of a, a cost to our, our, our taxpayers. But uh, um, I think the end result, you know, years down the road is, is going to be well worth it. So final question for you here, Bruce, before I let you go. In your opinion, what makes Brandon such a unique place to live, work and raise a family? Well, we're uh, about 51,000 people. Um, and I would say, and I have said this probably even before I was a counselor, that Brandon is a good size in the sense that we're a big enough city where we have everything that you need to live and have a good life without leaving our city limits. You know, we got a university, we have college, we have, you know, the recreational amenities, we have the businesses, all those kind of things. So I think that's a big plus, but we also still have a bit of a small town feel and we still have a sense I think of community and and uh, doing things uh, within our community that uh, that bring people out and and are are um, you know real benefit to everyone and I think that's that's why Brandon's great and I did want to it just struck me as I was talking Chris that the other thing I think we are proud of talk about things that we're doing right our um, truth and reconciliation week celebrations, I call them celebrations, but it's yep. awareness as well, that we do uh, around uh, Orange Shirt Day in, in late September that we've done now for, I guess, three years uh, are something that we're really proud of. We won a award a couple of years for it as well. Uh, those relationships that we've developed uh, with our Indigenous uh, people and continue to develop with Indigenous people, I think are really valuable as well. Bruce, I want to thank you. Yeah, I appreciate uh, when, it. When when you said fifty one thousand, I was like, "That's not that can't be possible." Then I remembered, yes, it is possible. But you're right. There is a small town feel to this city of Brandon, and I can't can't imagine a better way to end the three weeks of shows that we've been doing uh, with a counselor from Brandon for the Brandon AMM twenty twenty four Spring Convention. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. We want to thank the Association of Manitoba Municipalities for inviting us to this year's Spring Convention in Brandon, Manitoba. This episode would not have been possible without their support. Now, if you've enjoyed today's episode, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations with municipal leaders from across Canada on the cross-border interviews or our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, the local government at work. We are your go-to source for comprehensive municipal coverage from across Canada, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged on the issues affecting municipalities. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in amplifying the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking. 